Hello everyone. This welcome to this lecture BED 4110 disaster management lecture. This is a very relevant uh, lecture uh, in regard to what is happening to the world today in this uh, pandemic of uh, COVID-19. First things first. I would like to uh, take us through some of the things that we've been able to handle. What are the areas that we've been able to cover so far? In our introduction, we were able to appreciate the definition of key terms. Key terms here included many terms like what is disaster, what is emergency, what is the disaster risk reduction, what is vulnerability ETC. We were also able to appreciate the types and causes of disasters. Types and causes of disasters, uh, there are so many types, there are so many causes of disasters, and I am sure in your revision you will be able to interact with them. We were also able to appreciate the principles of emergency management. As emergency managers, we are well aware that there are principles, there are guiding principles that guide emergency managers. And I want to believe that in your uh, revision, you will also be able to interact and do a revision and also be able to read widely on the principles that guide emergency management. Earlier also, we were able to uh, look at a major area, a major topic of how we conduct needs assessment. Now, just to remind us that before we do our intervention, as far as disaster is concerned, and especially when we are getting into the response, we cannot get into any community without finding out what are the needs. And we were able to appreciate how we conduct the needs assessment. We looked at the methods, we looked at the tools, we looked at the uh, assessment biases, we looked at the priorities that are there uh, in regard to emergency needs assessment. Now, in our continuation uh, of the areas that we've been able to cover, we were also able to look at areas of uh, human rights issues within the context of emergencies. Some of the areas or issues that we are able to appreciate is gender. There are gender issues, gender human rights issues, there are cultural considerations, there are the roles of humanitarian actors and the challenges that are there as far as gathering information of human rights issues. Something that is also very key or a topic that is very key to every disaster manager is appreciating what disaster management cycle is. So we were able to appreciate the four main areas of disaster management, the cycle itself. One of them is mitigation. That is really the first one, students. The other one is preparedness. The other one is response. And the other one is recovery. We, when we understand all this, we need to understand the four phases, the, the, these four areas as the uh, main phases of disaster management, depending on your institution, depending on which or organization you are representing, you can make it as complicated as you would want and as biased as you would want, but these are the main areas. These are the main areas of the main areas of disaster management cycle. What are our lessons today? It is hoped and we hope and I don't think it's just hope. We are going to cover two lessons today. One of the lessons that we are going to cover is, number one, the role of non-governmental organizations in disaster management. Number two, we are going to look at these special groups. What am I calling special groups? I'm calling special groups uh, in, rela in relation to disaster management. The refugees are special groups. Asylum seekers are special groups. Uh, internally displaced persons are, 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 are special groups. Stateless persons are also special groups and will also be able to appreciate their characteristics. Now, 
Let's get to lesson number one. And let's appreciate what our objective for lesson number one is. We are able to describe the work done by non-governmental organizations in disaster management at the micro and macro level. Now, at this point, I want to state to us that when we are talking about non-governmental organizations, we do cover the broad spectrum. We are talking about the international non-governmental organizations, and those are actually at the macro level. We are also talking about the local non-governmental organizations, and we have them. In almost every country, we have uh, uh, organizations that supplement, uh, supplement or co complement the work that is done by the governments or states of that uh, uh, particular country. So we are also referring to that. At the very micro level, we are also referring to community-based organizations. Those are also non-governmental organizations. Now, we will, we will be able to describe the work done by non-governmental organizations in what? In disaster management at those levels. Now, let's get to the meat of our lesson number one. What are the general, general NGO roles? Number one, let's appreciate that the roles that we are talking here are roles that that particular organization has expertise on or is specialized in. No non-governmental organization, no international non-governmental organization, no community-based organization can be the jack of every trade. They do what they are trained to do. They do what they are experts in. They do what they are specialized in. So as we look at the general roles, it is good for us class to appreciate that these particular organizations must be expertise and trained and have skills in those particular areas. Now, let's go. In the pre-disaster phase in disaster management, the NGOs are able to bring in what we call the awareness generation. They are able to generate information that is needed by the communities. And we are talking at this pre-disaster phase. And in that, they are able to use education. They are able to use training. They are also able to use the formation of emergency task forces. Ta task forces are think tanks. There are people who come together to decide, should a disaster happen? What? is this that we ought to do. So again, in the pre-disaster phase, awareness generation through education and training, formation of emergency task forces is one that NGOs are able to do. They are also able to do or conduct activities as follows. They are able to have mock drills vulnerability assessment how vulnerable how vulnerable uh, how vulnerable is that community is if it's a place that is prone to uh, say for example flooding what are the mitigation measures Mod mock drills as the word says is just a mock you want to pretend that there is an emergency and want to see what will be the reaction of the people that are there in that particular organization or a country or a region. The other thing that NGOs are able to do, they are able to play a coordination role. How do they coordinate or to who do they coordinate? They coordinate with the government and non-governmental agencies. So let's appreciate at this point that those are some of the general roles in the predecessor phase that NGOs busy, busy themselves in. Uh, that is the pre-disaster phase. What happens or what is the role of NGOs immediately after a disaster? So the immediate aftermath of disaster phase, what are the NGOs expected to do? 
number one, they are able to extend assistance in rescue and first aid. They are there on spot trying to rescue, all right, and trying to bring first aid to the community or to the affected people. Number two, they are also able to offer sanitation and hygiene solutions. They are also able to conduct a damage assessment and they are also able to offer assistance to external agencies bringing relief materials. Those are some of the activities or the roles that NGOs will find themselves doing uh, in the immediate aftermath of the disasters. They are also able to offer guidance and counseling, I'll pick on counseling, because counseling is one that, um, uh, uh, one aspect that is needed, especially when there are losses, when there are fatalities, when there are accidents, all right? So there is a psychosocial support that is needed, and NGOs are able to offer guidance, they are also able to offer counseling. What else do they do? They are able to reunite families through search and rescue. When a disaster happens, things are disrupted. Infrastructure is disrupted. Some children actually disappear, not because they are, they are dead, no, but because they actually do not know what and where their, they, they, their, their parents are or their guardians are. And NGOs are there through search and rescue, and they are able to actually reconnect the, 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 the families back to one another. NGOs also provide technical and material support for safe construction. They are also able to revive educational institutions. They are able to restore means of livelihoods, and they are also able to monitor the pace of implementation, implementation for reconstruction and recovery initiative. When a disaster happens, institutions are destroyed. Infrastructure is destroyed. Even if the infrastructure is, is still intact, people do not, uh, the, the, the human resource may not be there because either the, the, their work has been disrupted because of the disaster. So NGOs come in handy to ensure that the educational facility or institution are restored and then people are able to feed for themselves. They are able to continue with their lives and their livelihoods. We continue class with appreciating the B part of the NGOs. We want to appreciate uh, the role of UN agencies in disaster management. Now remember, our objective was to be able to describe their role at the micro and macro level. We've been able to handle the macro level and maybe the middle level. Now we want to appreciate, we want to appreciate the um, uh, macro level. Now, we are going to handle it this way will be able to look at selected UN agencies, and then we'll be able to describe what is this that they do. Number one, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. This is called OCHA. What does it do? In collaboration with Interagency Standing Committee, coordinates national and international humanitarian providers to ensure a coherent response to emergencies. Let's also appreciate that OCHA advocates for people in need, promotes preparedness and prevention, and facilitates sustainable solutions. That is UN OCHA, the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Let's see the next one. Number two, Another UN organization, very, very critical again, is FAO. This is the Food and Agriculture Organization. What does FAO do? It provides early warning of possible food crisis and, uh, and assesses global food supply challenges. We know that the world will always find itself with several, with several disasters that can trigger food insecurity. 
in some countries of the world, we have had desert locusts. And FAO will come in handy through the early warning to try and warn na nations or the world at large if the countries are food secure or not. So they would busy themselves with the warnings of a possible food crisis and assess global food supply challenges and also be able to see how to handle those challenges. Number three, we have the IOM. What is IOM? IOM is the International Organization for Migration. What does it do? It helps um, transfer refugees, internally displaced persons, and others in need for internal or international migration services. Again, it helps transfer refugees, internally displaced persons, and others in need of internal or international migration services. People don't know what to do. If in their country there are issues of conflict and therefore they find themselves as refugees, yeah, they find themselves as, as refugees. They also do not know if there is conflict within the country and they find themselves being taken from their, 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 their home area and residing maybe in a school and they earn themselves a tag that is not very good called IDP, internally displaced person. They lose their identity. And so what such a person would want to have is an organization like IOM, which come, comes in handy and helps facilitate and ease their pain. Number four, UNHCHR. Please do not confuse this with the next one. It is the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. What does it do? It provides assistance and advice on human rights issues and it sets standards and monitors human rights violations. That is UNHCHR. That is what it does. It busies itself at the, at the macro level on human rights issues. Number five, we have the UNDP, United Nations Development Programs. What does it do? It assists in contingency planning, Disaster mitigation, prevention, and preparedness measures. That is United Nations Development Programs. I want you not to confuse the human rights, UN human rights body with the next one, UNHCR. United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees provides protection and assistance for refugees, stateless persons, and internally displaced persons, especially in conflict-related emergencies. Again, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees focuses on refugees, stateless persons, internally displaced persons, especially in conflict-related emergencies. We get to number seven. This is another UN body, UNICEF. What does UNICEF do? What does it stand for? It stands for the United Nations Children Emergency Fund. What does it do? It works to uphold children's rights, survival, development, and protection by doing what? By intervening in health, education, water, sanitation, and hygiene, and also protection. That is UNICEF, UNICEF which it's, it's, it's a worthy, very worthy, not that it supersedes all the others, but a child during the emergencies are not able. They don't even know, they're not able to uh, express themselves. They're not able to, they're not able to even mention who their mother is. Yeah, they're not able to mention who their parents are. So UNICEF comes in very handy to ensure that their rights are protected. They will not be exploited and they are able to be fed for survival etc now number eight we have wfp what is wfp this is the world food program uh, and is the principal supplier of relief food aid they work actually very closely with fao wfp 
will find themselves supplying. Where there is need, they will be there to do the supply for relief food. Say, for example, when there is a disaster related to the harsh climatic weather like droughts or even flooding, they will be there uh, to do the supply for relief food. Number nine, we have WHO. The World Health Organization provides global public health leadership by setting standards, monitoring health, uh, monitoring health trends, and providing direction on emergency health issues. In the current disaster, the current uh, uh, pandemic, we know the WHO has been there to guide the world on what to do as far as COVID-19 is concerned. It's also good to appreciate that WHO's role is to reduce avoidable loss of life and the burden of disease and disability. That is uh, WHO. Now, I need to take some water so that we can get to uh, lesson number two, and then we are able, first of all, to appreciate the objective for lesson number two. So, class, what is the objective for lesson number two? We are going to describe the refugees. Who are they? Who are the asylum seekers? Who are the internally displaced persons? Who are the stateless persons? And what are their characteristics? What are their characteristics? First of all, let us do some introduction. Many refugees uh, come from war-affected countries. It is good for us to know that refugees come from uh, war-affected countries. They have often experienced trauma, tragedy, persecution, and prolonged stay in transitional refugee camps. Some may have witnessed acts of violence, torture, and crime, sometimes against their own family members. Before we get to the refugees, in my introduction to this lecture, I mentioned that these are special groups. It is not easy. To find yourself in a disaster and you're a refugee, uh, you are a refugee. It is not easy to find yourself in a disaster and you are an IDP because you lose your identity. Class, what is this IDP? You had a name, but now you have had another tag. You are called IDP. So you lose your dignity, you lose your identity, and that is why it is important for us as the system managers to be to be able to appreciate the special groups and especially in the context of emergencies or disasters now let us be specific who are these refugees a refugee is someone who has been forced to free their country due to what persecution due to war or violence a refugee has well-founded fear of persecution for reason or of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. That is a refugee, a very, very difficult uh, position to be, especially when disaster strikes, when you have this tag, refugee. Who are these internally displaced persons? An internally displaced person has been forced again to free their home, but they have not closed the international border. If they would close the international border, then they, 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 are, they are refugees. But if they remain within the confines of their country, then they are IDPs. They are not in their homes but they have not closed the international border. These individuals seek safety anywhere they can find, in nearby towns, in nearby schools, in nearby settlements, in internal camps, in forests, in open fields. They will use anything 
to be able to find shelter. They will use makeshift, uh, makeshift, makeshift uh, uh, shelter. And it's really not easy for them, especially in a disaster, in a disaster, in a disaster situation. I'm smiling because experience shows us that IDPs don't move alone. If a disaster happens because of, 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 of any cause, then what happens? Then what happens is that uh, people will always move with their animals. They'll move with their dogs. They'll move with their uh, sheep. They will move with everything. So as a disaster manager, you have to consider in a, in a disaster situation how you will take care of this refugee, the person, and also their animals. You touch their animals, they can even die because they were carrying them because they are closely knit with that dog because it is, it, I mean, they, 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 are part, they, they are considered to be part of the family. Now, IDPs are not protected by the international law. They are also not eligible to receive many types of aid because they are legally under the protection of their own government. Again, it is good for us to appreciate that some of the, uh, some of the, some of the uh, privileges that a refugee will appreciate are not appreciated by IDPs. Let's get to the third one. The next uh, special group. These are the people we call stateless persons. A stateless person is someone who is not a citizen of any country. It is good to appreciate that citizenship is a legal bond between a government and an individual. And that is why, using the example of Kenya, in Kenya people have identity cards. What does that show? It shows that I belong to this country. They also have birth certificates to show that I was born here. And even those who are not in, that, but in this particular country, there are legal documents to show, hey, that they belong here. Now, citizenship is a legal bond between a government and an individual and allows for certain political, economic, social, and other rights of the individual as well as the responsibilities of both governments and citizens. A person can be stateless due to a variety of reasons, including sovereign, legal, technical, or administrative decisions or oversights. Who are asylum seekers? These are people who free their country, a seek sanctuary in another country. What do they do? They apply for asylum. Asylum means the right to be recognized as a refugee and thus receive legal protection and material assistance. An asylum seeker must demonstrate that his or her fear of persecution at her home country is real, is well founded, it is authentic. So no one would just think, oh, I will go to another country and apply for asylum. They have legal, I mean, they have legal, they have legal vetting for any person who will be termed or tagged as an asylum seeker. Very quickly, as we come to the end, what are the general characteristics of these special groups? Number one, they are victims of situations outside their control. Number two, they have loss of human dignity. Number three, they have loss of freedoms. What kind of freedoms? Loss of freedom to move, loss of freedom to express themselves, loss of freedom to own anything. Number four, they suffer social and economic exploitation, which leads to emotional torture. And number five, they have loss of identity. Six, they find themselves as aliens. Seven, they can suffer open discrimination and equal treatment. And number eight, they may suffer expulsion and or deportation. As we conclude this lecture, and as a disaster manager student, consider the following question. What is the action taken by government non-governmental organization in the wake of the global pandemic of coronavirus. Again, 
what is the action taken by governments, non-governmental organizations in the wake of global pandemic of coronavirus? There's a question, read widely, update yourself with the current news, see what NGOs are doing, and for your take home, that is your question. Till we meet in the next lesson, till we meet in the next lesson, uh, I want to thank you. We'll be meeting soon in the next lesson. Asante sana. Televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.